Okay, uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to continue my uh, uh, discussion about the uh, economy in India and the economic changes. Uh, I haven't really spoken much about the changes that started uh, post-1991, uh, uh, so I want to say a little bit about that. Uh, but uh, we, we're going to probably, you know, take about half, uh, about half the lecture will be uh, on this particular subject of uh, uh, how India has done uh, in, in, with respect to uh, economic reform and economic changes. And uh, then we'll move to the next segment of the course, which is uh, week four's readings, and that is on the Indian state and uh, politics uh, in India today. So let me uh, refresh your memory about where I was. Um, one of the things I mentioned to you was that uh, if you look at uh, the economy in India, um, or you look really more broadly at uh, contemporary India in relation to economic questions, uh, I, I had pointed out that there were several indices that you could use, several registers. Uh, so we could look at, uh, along which you could measure how India was doing. And you could look at things like food and agricultural production. Uh, something we looked at in some detail, uh, the question of education uh, in India, uh, which we looked at in some detail. And then there were several others which I was not able to look at uh, in my previous lecture. I want to spend just a little bit time on those before I move to the reforms of 1991, and then try to give you a portrait of contemporary uh, India uh, today. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I want you to be attentive uh, about uh, is uh, the question of gender inequalities in India. Uh, this is a subject that we're going to take up uh, if, in the, the latter part of the class, particularly when we get to that week, uh, which has to do with women in Indian society. Uh, and there we'll be looking not simply at uh, quantitative kinds of assessments, uh, but we'll be looking at uh, various kinds of phenomena related to women. We're going to be looking at the place of women in public and civil society and so on. But on the question of gender inequalities, I think it would be good to begin with a number of uh, uh, facts which are rather unpleasant. Uh, one of which is uh, something that I mentioned to you in previous lectures and uh, want to reiterate it now again, that the female-male ratio in India uh, is appallingly uh, poor. Uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh uh, all have a substantially lower number of women in relation to men. Uh, in India, according to the latest study that was done, the latest set of figures that we have, there are about 93 women for every 100 men. Uh, in Pakistan, it's 91. Okay? So we're talking about uh, a very substantial difference. And one of the pieces that you'll be looking at later on is a piece by Amartya Sen, uh, where he, a rather famous piece where he talks about 100 million missing women in India. And what he means by 100 million missing women uh, is uh, precisely this, namely that if you look at India, and the same will hold true for Pakistan uh, and Bangladesh as well, uh, and Nepal, uh, but if you look at these countries, it's very clear that uh, women on the whole have uh, suffered enormously uh, in several respects. Uh, so in Indian rural households, for example, it is rather common uh, when you have uh, scarcity of food, this becomes even a more acute problem. But uh, what's common is that uh, women generally tend to eat at the end. Okay, so the food that will be parceled out will first be given to male members of the family. Uh, and uh, consequently, you're going to find that uh, malnutrition rates for females are higher than they are for males. Okay, uh, there's another way to look at it. Uh, that is to look at the question of uh, female infanticide. Uh, which uh, is perhaps not as huge a problem in India as it used to be uh, today, uh, except uh, uh, that female infanticide, in the sense in which I'm speaking of it now, is almost a kind of a technical way of looking at it, because it's really talking about girls who are born and who are then done away with, uh, who are killed for one reason or the other uh, early on in life. Now, that phenomenon may not be such a pressing problem, but there's a more pressing problem, which is that lots of uh, 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 female uh, females are aborted um, when they're a fetus. Okay, so there was a there's a hospital in Mumbai. Um, I forget the name. I think it's called Just Slok Hospital, but I'm, I can't remember the name right now. And uh, somewhere back in about uh, the early 1990s, they did a study and they looked at 50,000 uh, 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 fetuses that had been aborted. 
uh, at this uh, hospital, and they found that with one exception, one out of 50,000, they were all female. Okay? Uh, so, you know, so that is obviously a form of female infanticide as well. You're not, it's not technically female infanticide because you're not killing a female infant, but you're basically preventing the female from being born. So this figure that is being given here by Amartya Sen uh, has, is being compiled, compiled by looking at a whole range of social and economic <laughs> phenomena, right? So uh, the neglect and indifference towards uh, females in some part of the country, uh, the a massive rate of uh, abortion of uh, particularly female uh, fetuses, and so on. Uh, and obviously, then you're going to have to look at uh, uh, the position of women uh, as they grow on. Uh, and we will find that there's going to be a substantial difference across, uh, you know, across class, caste, uh, degree of urbanization, so forth and so on. But we're going to leave that aside for, for a later consideration when we actually look at the section uh, on women. Now, there are some uh, interesting considerations here, which is that um, in the state of Kerala, a state that we have talked about on previous occasions, uh, there are 104 uh, women for every 100 males. Okay, so what we're saying is that the figures that we're looking at for India as a whole uh, do not in fact actually reflect regional disparities and regional phenomena, right? Uh, which of course also means that if in Kerala you have uh, more females than males uh, and the national ratio is 93 to 100, 93 women for every 100, 100 males, then of course what this means is that there are going to be some parts of India where the ratio of females to males is going to be substantially lower than 93, right? In order to get something like an average of that kind. Uh, and indeed, we find that in some parts of North India, uh, in Uttar Pradesh, uh, parts of Rajasthan, Bihar, uh, there are 800 women for every 1,000 males, okay? Uh, this also has consequences for marriage markets because then the question is what happens when you have uh, a surfeit of males in some areas and a shortage of females in some areas. So we are finding, in fact, that males in some parts of North India are now going all the way down south to get brides because there just aren't enough women in their part of the country. Okay, right? Uh, and this is something that has been commented on, you know, increasingly, you know, more often now uh, in the press in the last five years. I mean, there is, for example, there's a there was an article that came out in one of the major Indian newspapers about women uh, who had been brought from uh, Kerala, uh, who were now uh, the wives of men living uh, in the state of Rajasthan. Uh, so there you also had a cultural clash now, because not only do you have you know, people who belong to completely different linguistic backgrounds, but, but women who had grown up in a very different environment, now being brought as brides uh, to live uh, with their menfolk, uh, in North India, right? So an interesting set of questions that come up as a consequence of that, okay? Now, I should also say, by the way, that some people uh, may be under the impression, uh, and in India, the Hindu nationalists have certainly tried to convey this impression that these are problems that are more acute uh, uh, with Muslims, or these are problems that uh, afflict Muslim societies more, Muslim populations more, and that's entirely incorrect, because we know that Haryana and Punjab Okay, so if you're looking at the map of North India over here, right, so Haryana and Punjab are states over here in North India, just in the proximity of Delhi over here, uh, and Haryana and Punjab are states that have very, very small populations of Muslims, I mean minuscule populations of Muslims, okay? And we know that the female-male ratio in Haryana and Punjab is really, really bad. I mean, it's as bad as it is in Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, and Bihar. Right? And these are states that do not have Muslim populations. Right? So I'm just trying to suggest to you that there's not, no reason to believe that, that this has anything to do with, with Muslim societies. I mean, this is a problem that afflicts Indian society uh, as a whole. All right? uh, it is also the case that the states with, the, with poor female-male ratio, FMR, okay, uh, are also the fastest growing states in India in some respects. Okay, so that creates a new problem because what it means is that, is that if these are the states which have, in fact, the poorest F FMR, female-male ratio, and yet these are the fastest growing states, uh, we can expect that this problem is going to continue. That is, that their population rate 
population growth rate is higher in these states than it is in states which actually have a good female male ratio okay so that the percentage of women in fact actually continues to go down which is what we have seen in india in the last 60 years because about 40 years ago the female male ratio was about 97 uh, to 100 and now it is down to 93 to 100 okay all right so i think that this is a set of you know data that you might want to keep in in mind uh, when you're looking at gender inequalities, and here we are not really looking at such questions because we're going to save that, as I said, for a later occasion. We're not really looking at what kind of access do women have to jobs because obviously if you're looking at gender inequalities, we'd have to look at a whole range of other phenomena as well, right? Uh, what kind of equality of opportunity exists between men and women uh, in India and South Asia more broadly? Uh, do women have same access to public spaces? Um, as men do. And of course, uh, constitutionally speaking, they do. Uh, there is nothing in the Constitution which obviously says that uh, women do not have access to certain kinds of spaces or that women do, do not have the same entitlements uh, with respect to education. Uh, the Constitution of India is absolutely gender neutral about these matters. That is to say that uh, the right to an education is a right that uh, females have as much as males, right? So if you look at, if you, if we start to look at those social phenomena, um, we're going to see that there is a considerable uh, divergence or variance, namely that whatever the Constitution might say, the actual realities might be substantially different. And this is something that we're going to look at uh, when we look at the section on women, okay? Uh, now, let me raise another set of considerations, uh, and that has to do with demography and population growth uh, and uh, urbanization. Okay, so we've got a whole set of issues. I want to take them together uh, because there is some relationship, obviously. So when we speak about population growth rate uh, and when we speak about uh, demography, uh, there are, again, different ways we can look at it. We can see, you know, what, percent what percentage of the population of India consists of people who are relatively young. We're going to find that in all the South Asian countries, the young constitute a much greater proportion of the population than they do in countries such as the United States. Uh, and the United States is probably not the best example at the other extreme. The other extreme would be Japan, where a very substantial proportion of the population is, in fact, actually quite old. Okay, uh, so India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, these are countries which are really at the, at the other end. And that partly has to do with, obviously, the, the growth rate, uh, which uh, until recent years has been in India 2.9. Okay, the population growth rate has been 2.9. Now, in 1901, all right, just so that you get a comparative basis here, the birth rate and the death rate in India were about the same in 1901. And what that means, of course, is that you had no population growth, right? That the population in India in 1901 was relatively stable, okay? Um, today, the differential is 3 to 1. That is that the birth rate exceeds the death rate by a factor of 3 to 1, right? And that obviously accounts for the enormous increase in the population of India, uh, there are other things that have contributed to it, and one of the things that has contributed to it is obviously growing life expectancy. Uh, in 1901, the life expectancy in India was 23, right? In 1911, it had gone down to 20.2 because the first decade of the 20th century, uh, you had a substantial um, uh, mortality rate on account of famines, plague, and so on in many parts of India, so that in 1911, as I said, the life expectancy in India was a shockingly low 20.2. Uh, by comparison, in 1981, life expectancy had grown to 50.4. In 1991, it had grown to 58.7. And in 2001, which is the last census, the census in India is, by the way, conducted every 10 years. Okay, uh, and so the next census is going to be due in 2011. So in 2001, the life expectancy in India was 60.5. All right, um, so you can see a substantial increase there, right? So one of the things that obviously is accounting for the enormous ex population explosion uh, uh, over the last 50 years in India uh, is uh, the fact that the, the, not only that the birth rate has exceeded the death rate, but the life expectancy uh, has increased substantially, and that and that has to do with improved medical care, nutrition, sanitation, you know, so forth and so on. All right, okay. Um, now, uh, 
let's look at let's look at this in slightly greater detail. Okay, uh, we're saying that the population of India was pretty much stagnant, right? Uh, in 1901. That is, during the 19th century, the population of India didn't really register any kind of substantial increase. Uh, in fact, we know that from about uh, 1800 to 1900, the population of India grew uh, at most by 50 million. Okay? Um, and uh, in uh, 1947, at the time of partition, the population was roughly 400 million. It's 1.1 billion now, 1.1 billion and more. right? So we are talking about an enormous increase over the course of the last six decades, right? Uh, I think that this is also a reflection on the fact that uh, during the time that India was under British rule, particularly in the 19th century, uh, uh, India did not really register any kind of growth, partially because the economic and living conditions were extraordinarily poor. However poor they may be today, they were extraordinarily poor back then. India also had, in the 19th century, a very substantial okay, outward migration. So you could say that to some extent that might have contributed to the lower population uh, uh, you know, growth rate in India. There might have been some population stagnation for that reason. But not substantial enough to be able to account for the figures that I've given you. That is, a, you know, the kind of life expectancy figures that I've given you or the, or the fact that there was population stagnation, uh, as I said, in 1901. So between 1911 and 1921, the increase is going to be less than 1% uh, over these 10 years. Uh, on the other hand, uh, let's take a different decade. Let's take 1961, or let's take a different three decades, 1961 to 1991, when the population increase is going to be 21 to 24% increase every 10 years, okay? Now, in the 1950s um, uh, 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 and 60s, the Indian government started paying some attention to the question of how they were going to contain the population of India, okay? And this is, I think, where you have a substantial difference with the policy that was going to be adopted in China, uh, because in India, I think it was clearly understood, given that uh, at least nominally India was a, a democracy here, um, and if India was at least nominally a democracy, it meant that to some degree you couldn't really force uh, certain policies down the throats of people, right? Uh, obviously, the, the policy that some people who were inclined to be autocratic would have, the policy that they would have been inclined to pursue would have been a policy where uh, there would have been a, a maximum, uh, you know, there would have been a, 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 a number placed on how many children uh, a family could have, uh, whether it's one or two, uh, but no such uh, restrictions were ever placed upon the population in India. Now, Indira Gandhi's son, and you might recall uh, that Indira Gandhi is the woman who's going to serve as a prime minister of India. Uh, she is a daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru, and she comes into power uh, in the mid-1960s, right? Uh, and she holds power until 1977, uh, when she's going to be thrown out of office. Uh, she's going to become prime minister again. That's a different segment, but we're looking at this period from mid-1960s to the mid-1970s. So uh, she has uh, uh, two sons, uh, both of them now dead, uh, Sanjay Gandhi right, and Rajiv Gandhi. right. So uh, Sanjay Gandhi is the, if I may put it this way, the heir apparent to the throne. Okay, That's one way to describe him. That is that he is the one who's uh, being groomed to assume leadership in the Congress party. He's also severely disliked. Uh, and one of the reasons he's disliked is because one of the uh, things that he came up with uh, is a forced sterilization program. Okay, So you know, in other words, he's, he's one of these, if I may put it this way, modernizing middle class Indians who's thinking, all right, look, whatever economic progress we are achieving, all of this is being I'm putting it in a very colloquial way. All of this is being canceled out okay, by the fact that the population is increasing tremendously. Right? And of course, somebody like him is also looking at what kind of measures are being taken in other countries, particularly countries such as China, to control population. Uh, and so one of the things he did as one of the power brokers in the Congress party was to introduce what, what, what is referred to as a forced sterilization program. Right? So the forced sterilization program, the way it really runs is that you set a target. So you say that, and I'm giving you a random figure here, 
Okay, I'm giving you a random figure. Uh, you set a target and you say that, well, in the month of April of 1976, we want to be able to show that we have sterilized 500,000 people. Okay, and of course you're going to sterilize to really, for this to be meaningful, it means that you have to sterilize uh, people who are capable of producing children. Okay, so you either you know you sterilize a man. All right, you have a, you know, an operation done, a surgical operation, or you sterilize a woman, okay, right? Uh, but the woman obviously would have to be somebody who is capable, that is that she's still fertile, right? You can't take somebody who's 70 years old and, and then say we've met the target. The problem here was that is exactly what they started doing, all right? That is exactly what they started to do. When they found that they couldn't meet their targets, how do you meet a target? Right? So you say to a young woman and her husband, let's say in their 30s, right? you already have two kids. Why do you need any more? Right? And they give you a reason. This is why we need kids. You know, either we love children or we don't expect, you know, we're very poor and we don't expect uh, all our children to survive. So we want to make sure that we have at least a few children left alive. Right? Uh, or we want somebody to help us out on the farm. Whatever reason the couple gives you. right? The officer who is conducting the forced sterilization program, okay, who's out on field duty, so he persuades them that, all right, so if you don't have a third child, we will give you, you know, a, a six month supply of rice, sugar, and wheat absolutely free. You have to give some incentive. You have to give some incentive. So, whatever incentives there were, were obviously inadequate because what they found was that they were not meeting the targets. And if you were not meeting the targets, then from Sanjay Gandhi's point of view, it was very clear that this was because these poor people were really illiterate and did not understand the benefits of having small families. Okay? They did not understand that there was a co-relationship between having a small family and being able to push yourself into the middle class. That was a view that he had. All right, it's a highly, of course, paternalistic view because the assumption there is that you know, people like him and the people who are running the program really should be able to decide what's good for the country. And in particular, they should be able to decide how the poor should lead their lives. Because, of course, you can think, you can think of it this way, that you, no, for, no officer or a field worker uh, who was part of the campaign in this program would knock on a middle class door and say this kind of thing. You would be going to poor neighborhoods, working class neighborhoods, you'd be going to the slums, right? particularly in the urban areas. Okay? Right? This is where this program was being implemented. Right? Uh, and, and so one of the reasons that he became extraordinarily okay, unpopular is precisely because when they found that they could not meet the targets, they started roping in people, including men who were in their 60s, Okay, and sterilizing them. And then they would say, well, we've met the target. Okay, so the target was 200,000 people, and now we can show you here are the roads 200,000 people have actually been sterilized. Okay, so this is part of the whole study of demography that we're looking at here. That is, you know, obviously there's an intersection of politics, culture, right, various kinds of assumptions about how, you know, poor people behave. Uh, who should be con making policy decisions for them because they are not fit to make their own decisions, and so on. Anjana, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 not consensual because that, no, what, which it, it actually meant you would forcibly go into neighborhoods, and in this case we're talking about poor Muslim neighborhoods in particular, right? And one of the reasons you would pick a Muslim neighborhood is because the assumption here was again, Okay, and whether this is factually true or not is something that we'd, we'd have to look at. Uh, but even if it were, it wouldn't justify it, obviously. But the assumption was that the, growth of, that the growth rate among Muslims is substantially higher than it is among Hindus. Okay? So you would forcibly go into these neighborhoods, and in some cases, you would actually drag people out. Okay? You would actually drag people out. You would take that person right, in a vehicle to the hospital, have the sterilization done, and then you would drop that person back in that neighborhood. And this has been widely documented. I mean, this has been widely documented. I mean, this is one of the things that, as I said, really, you know, in some ways led to his unpopularity, Sanjay Gandhi's unpopularity. Yes. Uh, 
Well, you basically pick people who are defenseless. Yeah. You know, you're, you're going into a neighborhood. I mean, a young person might even run away from you. What if you're picking somebody who's 60 years old, you know? Yeah? I mean, so the idea was that you pick on people who are poor, defenseless, working class, okay? People who don't have either the physical or mental means to defend themselves for the most part. Okay, and I'm not saying, by the way, that this is something that dragged on for years on end. I mean, in fact, the pop, it became so unpopular that Sanjay Gandhi is, is sometimes viewed as being partly responsible for the electoral loss of his mother. Because let me remind you, and this is, we're going to be moving to the next segment, so I can tell you that right now. So, you, so 1947, right, India acquires independence, and until 1964, Nehru is the prime minister. He's going to be succeeded by a man called Lal Bahadur Shastri, but Shastri is going to have a heart attack, so he's only going to be a prime minister for, you know, basically about 18 months. And so effectively, we're saying 1966, early 1966 to 1977, uh, the prime minister is Indira Gandhi, right? And she is the daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister. So Indira Gandhi has these two sons that I mentioned to you, Sanjay Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi. Sanjay Gandhi is the one who's going to, who's going to really be in the vanguard uh, of this kind of development project in India. That is that you develop the country by enforcing, number one, a very strict population policy. Right? He was very clear about that, that you couldn't achieve a certain kind of development unless you really lowered the population. I mean, I would say that this is the largest, I mean, this is the most frequently encountered argument you will find in middle class families in India even today. Right? that whatever economic achievements India is capable of, whatever India has already achieved, that all of this will come to nothing if India does not contain its population. Okay? This is the most frequently encountered view you're going to find in middle class families. And then, of course, the thing is that if you put it this way, it sounds completely neutral. It sounds like simply a statement of fact. But then the minute you start pressing into an interrogation of what this comment means, then you find out that what it means is that, well, the people who really have to contain their population explosion are the people who are poor, working class, so forth and so on. Right? Okay? So this is where we begin to see that there is a politics to it. It's not simply a neutral statement of, exp you know, a statement of intent or expression of, you know, what they really feel. Right? Uh, that we'd have to start seeing, you know, who exactly will have to start you know, exercising some kind of control, and maybe that may be necessary. We're not making any normative assessment of whether, in fact, actually the poor should or should not have fewer children. Okay, but I'm saying that this is the most frequently voiced opinion. Okay, so Indira Gandhi has these two sons, uh, and uh, Sanjay Gandhi's, uh, and you know, 1977 is when she loses the election, right, because in 1975 she had imposed an emergency. And this speaks, by the way, to the question that you had asked, and the question, you know, that sort of lurking around here, which is, well, how was this really possible? You know, who, who was being picked, so forth and so on. One of the reasons why it could be done with relative ease is because in 1975, Indra Gandhi had imposed an emergency, something that I've talked to you about before, and which is mentioned in, in the readings that you've done, right? Now, when she imposes an emergency, what this means is, is that some of your constitutional rights are suspended. What are the grounds for imposing the emergency in 1975? That India is faced with internal dissent and external enemies. Okay? That there is political instability which threatens to demolish the project of India. Right? So she imposes an emergency in 1975, and under the cloak of the emergency, it was much easier to do things like the sterilization program or slum demolition. Right? One of the other pet projects of Sanjay Gandhi was slum demolition. That is that you go to these areas where slums have been set up, you go with you know, bulldozers and you demolish the slums. And a lot of people said, well, it should be done because these are illegal. The only problem is you're dealing with human beings. Right? If you demolish a slum, well, the people who are living there, where do they go? Right? Where do you move them? Do you have an adequate place for them? Okay? And this is where we're going to, and so we're moving into questions, you know, which are central to this segment here, segment four, which is, you might say, well, what is the responsibility of the state in these kinds of instances, right? Does the state have any kind of responsibility at all? All right? But anyhow, before we get to that, this is just to give you a sense of, uh, 
you know, that when you start to look at these dry facts about population and population growth, so forth and so on, I think that once again we're going to have to, in some ways, liven up the narrative by looking at these kinds of cultural histories and episodes, okay, such as the one that I've just narrated to you about uh, the sterilization program that was undertaken in the mid-1970s. Now, one of the most significant changes that has taken place in India, um, and you could say that this is true probably of almost any third world country, uh, but here we are looking strictly at India and we're looking at South Asia as a whole, and that significant change is the growing urbanization of the country, okay? Um, if, you're looking at, if you're looking at cities, right, uh, with a population of 10 million or more, uh, you're talking about uh, uh, Mumbai or Bombay as it used to be called, uh, Delhi, uh, Madras, uh, or now called Chennai, and Kolkata, right, or Calcutta. We're talking about four cities. Uh, then we're talking about two cities with, with populations of 5 to 10 million, Bangalore and Hyderabad. Uh, these are figures that go back a few years ago because within a few years all of this is going to change because Bangalore and Hyderabad are certainly going to get into uh, the list of cities w which are now considered, you know, the big metros. So the four big metros are the ones that I described to you, and then you've got Bangalore and Hyderabad, but they're already more or less, you know, made their way into that list as well, okay? Uh, and then you have, obviously, uh, cities uh, with populations of uh, between 1 to 5 million, uh, and they're uh, close to 25 cities in India of that kind, okay? Now, uh, statistically speaking, the share of urban population in India in 1901 was 10%, right? Uh, in 1941, it had risen to 12.8%. This is before independence, which means that during the period of British rule in India, particularly the last half century of British rule in India, uh, urbanization did not increase in India at all. I mean, only very marginally, from 10 to 12.8 percent, right? Very, very marginal increase. In 1991, the share of urban population in India had gone up to 27 percent, uh, and uh, the 2001 census indicates that the share of urban population in India is now about 35 percent. Okay, so roughly one-third of the country. And when we say urban India here, we're not referring just to the big cities um, or even the next tier of cities, you know, we're referring as well to small towns, okay? Uh, of course, you know, if you have a, if you have a place that's pop got a population of 5,000 or 10,000, uh, you can't consider it a small town because when we say small town here, we're still talking about 100,000, 200,000, you know, something in that neighborhood. Uh, but it's not just numbers. The question is, what gives a city its texture? What gives a city its texture? How is city life different from life in the villages, right? And so this is where I think that the numbers are not, in my view, uh, you know, extremely expressive of the realities in India because you could say that, well, there's a town and this has a population of one million and one million means that you're talking about a population that is now an urban population, okay? You could say that if you're looking at just sheer numbers. But if the texture of that town has very little of the texture of a big city, the flavor of a city, right? And then you'd have to ask, well, what accounts for a city being a city, right? Uh, does it have a certain kind of conception of cultural life? Is a city a place where you can walk, right? I mean, if you took that as a definition, then Los Angeles, frankly, is not much of a city because this is really a place where you drive, right? I mean, this is not a place that was intended for pedestrians. It's a place intended for motorists for the most part, right? And so then you have to go to some, you know, place like Santa Monica, Third Street, you know, which somehow, you know, becomes a city because you can walk around, okay, over there. But if you're looking at that kind of, you know, idea of what constitutes a city, I'm saying that these statistics may not be particularly useful because many of the places that pass for urban areas in India, really, it seems to me, are more places that still retain the flavor of a rural landscape, okay? Uh, the lifestyle of a village, okay? Uh, but this particular shift that I'm talking about has several consequences. And we're not going to look at all of them, but let me suggest a couple of them. When you have a substantial shift from rural areas to urban areas, it also means that you're going to have a substantial shift from agri an agricultural-based economy to an economy based on other things, which would, in this case, mean 
manufacturing services, finance industries, and so on, right? And I think that there's no question that we have seen that kind of shift in India, okay? Uh, manufacturing in 1901 accounted for 11%, okay, of all the revenues in India, 11%, right? In 1991, it was accounting for 28%. And I think in 2001, it accounts for over 40%, okay? In fact, actually, there is also a very substantial difference between the number of people who are employed in a particular sector and how much revenues you get from that because Indian agriculture still employs roughly two-thirds of the working population of India. But Indian agriculture does not, in fact, actually produce two-thirds of the total revenues in India, right? right? So the manufacturing sector, which accounts for a smaller percentage of the population, is actually going to produce a pro disproportionately higher percentage of the revenues, right? But nonetheless, there has been a significant shift from agriculture to manufacturing. Um, the other kind of thing that you can think about is something that I've spoken to you about in an earlier context, and that is that when you have a population explosion in the urban areas, uh, it means that some of the kinds of constraints and community feelings that might have existed okay, uh, in the rural area, that these kind of disappear. What does that mean? What it means is that if you look at violence in India, particularly what is called communal violence, this is a subject on which we're going to talk about a great deal more later on, communal violence. So communal violence, just let's, for the time being, tentatively, just speak, just understand it as a form of conflict which takes place where people identify themselves, okay, primarily through their religion, okay? So you can view communal violence as a kind of conflict that takes place between adherents of different religions, right? So ad adherents of Islam versus adherents of Hinduism or adherents of Hinduism versus adherents of Islam, so forth and so on, right? Now, if you look at, if you look at communal violence in India, there is no question whatsoever that it is a much greater phenomenon in urban areas than it is in rural areas, okay? And one of the reasons for that may well be that in urban areas, particularly areas that have grown very recently, that have grown by huge numbers, that the kinds of community feelings that exist between people in older settlements, the kinds of constraints that are exercised of neighborliness, that these do not exist in the new urban setting, okay? That is, people don't know each other. You know, you're much more likely to commit violence against people who are strangers to you and to whom you are str a stranger, right? So when we say that there's been increasing urbanization in India, it has various kinds of consequences. So what, what it means is that, well, yes, there's been a shift of population, but this shift of population means that the economy is now moving in different directions. The state is going to be more attentive to certain sectors of the economy, right? Then it is going to be to other sectors of the economy. It also means that you may have greater violence taking place in these new urban concentrations than was the case in rural areas, right? I mean, these are just some of the consequences because obviously, as I've already suggested to you, when we speak about urbanization and all of that and the growth of cities, that we, we cannot simply take numbers. What we also have to do is we have to look at what is exactly is it that makes a city a city? What is the quality of life? Uh, does, it, does the city need a certain quantum of culture, okay, in order to be considered a city? You know, do you need to be able to say that, well, a city is a place that generates a certain amount of cultural activity in theater, in the arts, in cinema, right? And this is what, in part, accounts for a city, that a city should have a culture of bookstores, right, so forth and so on. Right? And so I'm, I'm suggesting that if one starts to really seriously look at it, then it seems to me that some of the data that we have about what is called cities uh, in India um, has no necessary relationship to what exactly a city is. Right? So I'm suggesting that you might also want to make a distinction between urbanization and between urbanization and cities. That is that all urbanization does not lead to cities, okay, necessarily. All right, now, in 1991, right? In 1991, you, some people say it goes back to 1989. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it's that period between 1989 to 1991. The Indian government decided that it was going to, in some ways, jettison 
its earlier economic policies. Okay, and the earlier economic policies, recall, meant that India had these five-year plans. Okay, so you set these targets. You said we need so much production in coal, steel, iron, sugar, milk, whatever it is. You set these targets. You try to meet these targets. That's what a five-year plan does in part. Of course, it creates economic policy, but it also sets targets. And you said we want to meet these targets, right? And in part, what this meant was that when these targets were sent, set for steel, iron, coal, whatever it is, right, that the Indian government decided that it was going to invest heavily in various kinds of projects that would enable them to meet these targets. So you had a heavy investment in state-run enterprises, okay? And so when I say state-run enterprises, a typical example would be, for example, an organization called Bhel, okay? So that's Bharat Hindustan Electronics Limited. Okay, right? right? So this is a typical, or, typical, you know, state-run organization. What does a state-run organization do? It creates electronic items, right? Okay, and so in the first f four decades, first four to five decades, essentially, it has been argued the private sector in India was throttled. It was contained. Now, that doesn't mean that India did not allow any development of the private sector. And in fact, some people have argued that, that to the extent that India had any growth at all, it was because of the private sector. And there's a considerable amount of disagreement about these things, because I think it depends on the predilection of the economist. I mean, those economists who uh, have always favored a free market approach have a very different interpretation of what happened in the first five decades. And those economists who uh, uh, have uh, favored a mixed economy kind of approach have a different interpretation. And India is typically considered a, a, an example of a mixed economy, uh, although the mix there was not an even mix. Some people would say that it was still more state-centric rather than private-centric, okay? But the long and short of it is that you've got a planning commission, you've got five-year plans, you've got, he you've got state enterprises, um, particularly in the areas having to do with steel mines, production of iron, okay, so forth and so on. And uh, the attempt was to make India to some degree self-reliant, okay, self-reliant. So this was partly a response to the long period that India had been under colonial rule, where India was obviously a dependency. So now the argument was that India was going to become a self-reliant country to the extent that it was possible. Um, this also meant that India limited the amount of foreign investment that could be made possible in the country, right? So if you look at, for example, uh, banks, you look at publishing firms, right? The rule was that a foreign investor could not own more than 49.5% of the shares of the company, right? Because if it was more than 50%, then obviously control would go to the foreign investor, right? And this rule was rigorously followed. In fact, even today, even after the economic reforms of 1991, uh, these kinds of regulations have still stayed in place for the most part. I mean, India has relaxed them in a few spheres, okay? But banks is a very good example where the Indian banking is in a much better shape than banking in most other parts of the world, particularly after the economic crisis of the last two years, partly because in India it was a very clear understanding that the banks would not be allowed to be turned over, okay, uh, to large multinationals. Okay, so this is the kind of economy that we are talking about in the period from independence down to the late 1980s. Now, in 1989, 1990, India's foreign exchange reserves were zero. India had no foreign exchange reserves at all. Uh, the country was a, in a bad shape. And some people have argued that India always responds best in a crisis. Okay? I mean, this is, again, an interesting argument. We don't really have, I think, the time here to give it, give it our full consideration. But uh, it, it has been suggested that one reason why India had to, had to open itself up in 1989, 1990, that period, is because India was now in an economic crisis. It had no foreign exchange reserves whatsoever. Um, and the growth rate had not really registered any kind of substantial increase. Okay? So in 1990, 1991, India decides to liberalize its economy, which means that it de to, some, to some degree it also accepts the kinds of dictates that were coming down from the World Bank and the, and the International Monetary Fund. 
uh, structural readjustment programs, as they're called, nothing as acute as it was in the case of South American countries where they were completely held hostage to what the World Bank wanted to do, what the IMF wanted to do. Uh, India was, for one thing, much too large. The other thing was that you, you, you did have, a, as I said, a mixed economy. Uh, and so in, to that extent, India was not really going to be held hostage, if I may put it this way, uh, to the World Bank or to the IMF after 1991. But it did mean that there were going to be substantial changes in the regulations in India that affected business. And one of those uh, changes can be best described in the following way. India used to be considered from that period from 1947 to the late 1980s, early 1990s, it used to be considered, I'm going to use a phrase that you may encounter in the reading, a license Raj. Okay? So Raj is the word for rule, okay? And it was license meaning a permit. So here it's like a driver's license, right? It's a permit that enables you to drive, okay? So India was considered a license Raj, which meant that for anybody to do any kind of business in India, you had to get dozens of permits. It was a disincentive. And each permit, by the way, would have to be filled out and triplicate. You know, this, they love to do that. The amount of paperwork that accumulates in India is just astronomical, OK? Right? Um, you know, it's like, it's like the driver's license office in, in Delhi. You ever go there? I was there last year. It's just amazing how they work because you fill out an application, uh, and you have to fill it out three times in triplicate, OK? Uh, and then you think they're going to file it. Well, they don't really file it, because what they do is they put it in a sack, and they're like thousands of sacks. I mean, you know, if they ever had to find an application from 20 years ago, let's say somebody you know, who they suspected was a terrorist and they wanted to know about his background, well, it's impossible. I mean, they'd never be able to find it. You know? So why they ask for three copies, God only knows. Maybe it's just you know, sheer habit. Right? But that's what license Raj means, okay? that for everything, you had to basically get a permit. You had to get permission, uh, which meant that you were dealing with a bureaucracy, right? enormous bureaucracy. So the idea of the reforms of 1991, in part, putting it in very simple language, was to ease the bureaucratic regulations and constraints, okay? give an incentive to people to come to India and invest in Indian business. Okay? And one other consideration that you must keep in mind, this is not as acute a consideration in 1991. It is going to become a much greater consideration beginning in the mid-1990s and remains a consideration today, is the presence of an affluent Indian population in countries such as the United States. They're trying to woo these people. The Indian government is trying to woo these people. They're not going to be able to woo them if you've got a license Raj going on. Okay? Because these are the people who have fled India for that reason. So they're not going to come back and try to invest in India if they have to deal with all of these bureaucratic hurdles. Right? And by the mid-1990s, you have a substantial growth of the Indian diasporic population, which is now an affluent population. You always had a diasporic population, but you didn't have an affluent diaspor diasporic population. And by the mid-1990s, that picture is beginning to change very substantially. Okay. So essentially now, what we're saying is that from 1991, okay, and down to the present day now, and this will continue, a series of economic reforms is going to come into place. Uh, and one of the things that they realize in India is that they can actually become a world market for certain kinds of things. So to give you a simple illustration that all of you are aware of, but now we have the context for that, uh, what can you become a world market for? Outsourcing. Okay? You can become a market for outsourcing. So you set up call centers in India. right? And so when you're placing your AT&T call over here, whatever it is, you want to talk to the operator you know, about some disputed bill uh, or the gas company, the likelihood is that this call is actually being answered by somebody sitting in India. Okay? Now, here again, there are cultural elements to this story. Okay? I think that you will get the statistics from various kinds of business magazines and the internet and so forth and so on. But I think some of the cultural elements of this story are quite interesting. Uh, so let's just consider that very briefly before we move to one other aspect of this story of economic reforms and globalization and so on, uh, and that is the, you know, the suicide by farmers, which I'm going to speak about. But when I say cultural elements to this story of outsourcing and call centers, uh, let's consider the following. 
the places where these call centers have been set up, so here's, here's uh, let's say, a rough map of Delhi, okay? Something like this. There is a road, by the way, here. It's called the Ring Road. Uh, this is a very British idea, so you find the Ring Road uh, in London as well. You find it in some English cities. So there's a Ring Road, and why is it called a Ring Road? Because it, it, it basically goes around, okay? So there's a Ring Road. Uh, so this is Delhi, and that includes Old Delhi and New Delhi. And here you have a river. It's called the Yamuna River. And here you have a kind of a satellite town, if I may put it this way. Uh, it has now got a population of well over a million in itself. Um, and it's called Noida. And then on, on the southwest here, you have another huge okay, uh, satellite sort of city. Used to be a lazy village, really, uh, 15 years ago, okay, called Gurgaon. Okay, Gurgaon. And it's actually literally in the state of Haryana. So this is in the state of Haryana. And this is in the state of UP. But Noida and Gurgaon are part of Greater Delhi. They're part of Greater Delhi now. Okay, the Delhi metropolitan area. A lot of the call centers have been set up in this place, in Gurgaon. Gurgaon is also the place which has the largest concentration of malls in India. Okay, malls. All right? And when I say malls here, um, what am I speaking about? I'm speaking about something quite similar to what you have over here. Okay, maybe they're not as gigantic as the ones over here because uh, on the whole, even the malls in India tend to have somewhat smaller stores, but the concept is the same. You know, you go to a place and, and you can, you know, one-stop uh, shopping, theoretically, right? Okay, um, and there's a kind of a mall culture that is developing in India as well. Okay, slowly, slowly. And some people see that as a sign of progress, obviously, because it means that you're catching up with the West. And some people who are a little bit more sensitive to these things or come from a more of a cultural nationalist standpoint, you know, they find this highly disturbing because what it's doing is it's driving out, you know, the smaller shopkeepers and entrepreneurs, okay? So uh, uh, one of the, one of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, enterprises that has come up in India. And again, this is, a, this is a kind of change that has taken place in India in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, there's a company called Reliance Fresh, okay? Reliance Fresh, and uh, you know, so instead of buying your vegetables and fruits now from the vegetable vendor who comes to your door, okay, on a bicycle or in a cart, uh, or buying them from the vegetable market, uh, you go to this place, Reliance Fresh, so Reliance is the name of an Indian multinational company, extremely, you know, affluent, one of the largest companies of its kind in the world, and they've got various, they have obviously branched off into numerous kinds of businesses, so one of the things they've set up is something called Reliance Fresh, uh, and what does Reliance Fresh do? You can go to these places and, like a store over here, um, except that this is India, so they've forgotten how to treat their own vegetables and fruits. So, for example, you do not keep mangoes um, in the cold section, right? I mean, everybody in India who eats mangoes, and almost everybody does, would know how to treat a mango. But in Reliance Fresh, you can get a mango the American style. So it's all cleaned up, it looks very nice, and it's in a cold storage area, which means that it's inedible as a mango. But nonetheless, you can get it there. You can get your fruits, you can get your vegetables, whatever you want, right? And it comes neatly packed and everything, and the men and women are wearing aprons, and the guys are wearing something on their head, you know, the women are wearing so the hair doesn't fall anywhere. You know, that's the idea. And it means, of course, you have to pay a price which is, let's say, four times higher for broccoli or whatever it is, okay? So this is a kind of store that has now come into these malls in Gurgaon, Gurgaon is also a place which has developed a whole culture of restaurants. Okay? Now, all of this is related to the outsourcing. Because one of the things you have to understand is who is involved in this business okay? of call centers, BPOs, business processing offices, right? Who is involved in it? Tends to be a very young clientele that is a clientele is not the word right here, a, a, a very young employee group, okay? Most of the people who work for these call centers, you're talking about people in their early 20s, okay? Early 20s, mid-20s, um, they get burned out very fast, 
because for one thing, what you have to do, given the time difference between the United States and India, so you know, you're basically 12 hours, uh, what it means is that uh, these people are working really odd hours of the night, okay? Right, in order to get, in order to respond to the calls that are being made from here, okay? Uh, so these people, and what it also means, by the way, that Satvinder, uh, let's just take a random name, so Satvinder is an employee there, uh, when he answers the phone, he has to pretend he's Sam, okay? And so he is first tutored and trained. I mean, by the way, there are good, good feature films that have been made on this kind of question now, documentaries as well. So Satvinder is going to first spend one month training uh, in some hot place in outside Delhi uh, in how to develop a Texan accent. He's going to be trained for two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, okay? Right? So he essentially in a very curious kind of way, has to forego his identity, uh, which is what happened to him or to his ancestors under colonial rule as well, if you think about it, right? Okay, because under colonial rule, the idea was that the person really had to emulate the West. You had to learn English in order to become a Babu. Okay, and now in a curious way, 60 years after independence, we are going through that same cycle again. Right? We're going through that same cycle again. And in fact, there is a phrase that has been invented for people like Satvinder slash Sam, uh, right? And that phrase is cyber coolies now, okay? You know, the word coolie is a pejorative word. It was used to refer to people. It's a word uh, to refer to people who did, um, you know, hard manual labor. But in South Africa, the word coolie was used for every Indian. Every Indian was referred to as a coolie, including Bohan Das Gandhi, who spent 20 years in South Africa. Right? So he's referred to as a coolie. So it's a pejorative word. And now Satvinder slash Sam is a group of people who some scholars refer to as cyber coolies. That is, that they're still doing the work okay, of slaves, in a way, except that they're doing it in a cyber age, and they're doing it through the internet. Okay? And again, you can have a different perspective on that. I, I grant you that, and I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with this description as well either, but there is something I think that we have to ponder about when we look at this phenomena, because we can say that, all right, so what these call centers have done is they've generated revenue in India, uh, they've generated a whole bunch of new jobs, okay, um, and they have created a whole set of cultural issues for the next generation and for their own generation to consider. And, and some of them may be better, some of them may be for the good, some of them are obviously not for the good. Okay, so one of the things that's happened, for example, and you see that, by the way, in the accounts given by young women who work at these call centers, some of them feel emancipated because they have been able to escape from the home, okay, and acquire a certain kind of economic independence which they never had before. Right? I mean, this has, been, this has been argued by some of these women. We also find, by the way, why is it that these, these malls have developed in Gurgaon, right? Because these are the people who are making, by Indian standards, a relatively good sum of money, young people, and they are engaging in consumption, right? So that's the relationship between the call centers and the restaurants, okay, and the malls, right? I mean, who is frequenting these restaurants? So if you go to these restaurants, you find it's mainly the young people who be working at the call centers, you know, finish up their job, and then you go and have a meal at one of these restaurants, okay? So I think that you could say, I mean, it's possible to argue that you could say that it has brought a degree of economic independence to some people, okay, to a young generation of Indians. And the interesting thing is that many of these people who work in these call centers, they don't come from, if I may put it this way, really urban families over a period of two or three generations. These are people who have recently moved into the city. Their families might have moved into the city 10, 15 years ago from smaller towns, upwardly mobile. This is a good opportunity to become more upwardly mobile because obviously the more wealthy families, they do not want their children working in these kinds of places. Right? There's also other kinds of issues that have developed, security of women. So, you know, typically you finish your work at the call center, let's say, at 3 a.m. in the morning, okay, in Delhi, in Gurgaon. You finish your work at 3 a.m. in the morning, then there's this whole question, well, there's got to be some kind of adequate transportation system to get these women back to their homes, okay? So this issue is coming up. I mean, I'm just giving you a sense of what are the kinds of issues that come up in 
conversations in middle class Indian society today. This is a huge issue now, right? What do you do with these people who finish work at 3 a.m., particularly a lot of young women, right? Uh, because there have been obviously a growth of crimes around these call centers in the last five or six years. This has been widely documented as well. All right? So you could say that, look, I mean, there are different ways to consider this, this whole issue. And what we're doing here is we're putting a, a flesh to this question, which would otherwise be a question that you would look through statistics and you would say, ah, you know, India generates so much revenues through call centers, or India accounts for so much of the outsourcing business uh, in the world. It does account for a very substantial portion of it, by the way. Okay, right? But those are just numbers. Then you have to say, well, what are the kinds of cultural histories that are being written through these innovations? Okay, how is that altering the physical, mental, cultural landscape of India in many ways? Right? And I'm suggesting to you that in some ways this is a new form of servitude. In some ways, no question about it. Um, you also find, as I said, that these people last at these because these are, you know, pretty grueling jobs. Right? You work there for eight or ten hours, you know constantly answering phones, and after a while you just get burnt out. I mean, they've found that typically a person doesn't last at a call center for more than a year or two, typically. Okay? And there is, by the way, a very small uh, scene of a call center uh, in Slumdog Millionaire, if you remember where this person worked for a short period of time as a chaiwala. Okay? Right? Okay? And he, in fact, he even takes over the, a person's job for that 30 seconds or whatever it is, you know, right? Okay? So, that's the culture that we're really speaking about. All right, now let me move to a very different dimension of the story of economic change and globalization, a very different dimension. And that is what has been happening in Indian agriculture, okay, uh, in the last, uh, in the course of the last uh, 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 15 years. Indian agriculture is, it seems to me, in a extremely critical state. Uh, there are several ways to measure it. One way to measure it is to look at what percentage of the national budget is apportioned towards Indian agriculture. Another way to look at it, and that's what we're going to do very briefly, is to look at suicides by farmers. Okay? And to give you a sense of the scale, you know, in, in a, a passing remark last week, or maybe, uh, I think last week I mentioned to you that there were over 100,000 uh, farmers who have committed suicide in the last 10 years. Uh, the exact figure, by the way, is 1.9 lakhs, which means 190,000. Okay, uh, I'm giving, I gave you a slightly lower figure uh, last week because uh, some people dispute how these figures okay, have been calculated. Okay? Uh, but it seems to me pretty clear from the scholarship that has been done, and, and in fact, actually from various government reports, uh, that 190,000 is not an overstatement at all, okay, of the number of farmers who have committed suicide. And I think to understand that, it is important to understand that there has always been a certain amount of agrarian distress and unrest in India. Okay, now I want you to understand that because I think someone might just say hypothetically, well, how do we know that these suicides were not taking place before? How do we know that when farmers were feeling really desperate that they didn't take their own lives? You know? Isn't it the case that we know more about these things now because after all we are living in the late 20th century, early 21st century and we have much better information about these things, we are more sensitized to these things, right? right? That could be a hypothetical objection. So that's why I think it's better to understand that I'm not trying to say that agriculture in India was in a wonderful state, always. Because I think that whenever you get to agricultural societies, and India was a predominantly agricultural society with respect to employment, it still is a predominantly agricultural society. That is what percentage of the population, working population, is actually employed in agriculture, right? And whenever you've had an agricultural society of that kind, it is very clear that there have been moments when there has been enormous amount of distress. That is, that farmers who have not been able to make ends meet. And what does a farmer do when he is not able to feed his family and the larger population outside? Because the task of a, a farmer is to feed not just his own family, but to feed a larger population. Right? Okay? So what do farmers do? 
Right? And so I'm suggesting to you that if you look at the history of India, it's very clear that there has always been a certain amount of unrest and distress. And when I say unrest, those are not two different, they're two different things, and yet they're related because when you have distress, that is when, that is when farmers are in a state of depression, okay, and agriculture is not doing well, okay, uh, it also leads to violence. It leads to riots. It leads to disturbances, okay? But there is nothing to suggest in the historical record of India that the problem has ever been as acute as it is today, okay? So this is where I think that we have to pause and we have to say, well, something different is happening in the state of Indian agriculture today than has been the case in the 19th century, 18th century, or any previous time that we can think of, okay? I'm not trying to suggest that Indian agriculture was wonderful. Of course not. And because otherwise, if I say to you, well, close to 200,000 fa farmers have lost their lives or have committed suicide, to put it more explicitly, then I think the logical question to ask is, what is driving them to do that? What does it mean for the state of Indian agriculture that 200,000 farmers have committed suicide? And how do they commit suicide, by the way? And the vast majority of the cases, by drinking fertilizer or pesticide, OK? Right? Widely documented, okay? And this, there is a particular re region of the state of Maharashtra. So Maharashtra is Western India, as you know by now, okay? State over here, large state over here. Mumbai is, is uh, 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 in Maharashtra. And there is a region of Maharashtra, it's called Vidharba, okay? So in Vidharba, over the last uh, decade, there has been a, a suicide by a farmer every eight hours, every eight hours, okay? And it's continued over a period of time. Last, last year, they recorded over 1,000 deaths in Vidarbha. They've been doing that for the last. This is one single district in the state of Maharashtra. Now, there are some states which are more prone to this problem than other states, okay? But we don't need to get into the regional histories here because then we'll have to really look at, you know, Okay, you know, I mean, we'd have to give this, uh, 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 this problem a much more attention than we can. I just want you to get an overview of it to get a sense of what is really at stake over here. Uh, but there are six or seven states uh, where the problem is much more acute than it is in the other states in India, all right? Uh, but these six, seven states together account for good, a good 30% of the population of India, all right? Now, 200,000 people dead, what may be accounting for it? Okay, and there are simple ways to look at it. So one way you, you look at it is you say, and I'm using the language that is now used by people who study this kind of problem, you say that a farmer spends so much money on inputs. So inputs here means the money that you spend, okay, on such things as fertilizer, seeds, okay, water. You may have to pay for the irri for irrigation irrigating the land. You may or may not have to. It depends on whether your, your farm is rain-fed or whether, in fact, you actually have a system of irrigation. So, and if you have a system of irrigation, you, are you actually paying somebody right, to get that water? Okay? So these are all what are called inputs. Okay? And the simple way to make a calculation according to, for example, uh, an agricultural economist is to, is to ask whether the inputs are greater than the outputs. And, we, and, the, and in that case, it simply means, by the way, in the, long, in the final analysis, the money you get okay, per ton of wheat or sugar, wheat or cotton or whatever the crop is that you're growing. Uh, cotton farmers have been particularly susceptible here. Okay? So we're going to look at cotton for a second here. Cotton farmers have been particularly susceptible. So in Vidarbha, they're mainly cotton farmers. They may be growing other things too, soya bean, for example. Okay, right? But cotton farmers, as I said, have been particularly susceptible. So you would say, okay, this is what it costs to produce a ton of cotton, okay? And this is what a ton of cotton sells in the market. Okay, either in the open market or this is what the government of India pays the farmer for a ton of cotton, right? And if you find that that money that is being paid is substantially lower than the inputs, 
what that means, of course, is that the debt of the farmer is growing, right? Because if the farmer is, let's say, hypothetically, you know, spending a thousand rupees, okay, to produce this ton of cotton, okay, just a hypothetical figure, but he's only getting 800 rupees when he sells it on the open market, okay, then we're saying that for every ton of cotton that he's actually selling, he's incurring a loss of 200 rupees, right? Now, if he's incurring a loss of 200 rupees per ton, and you're talking about hundreds of tons, right, his debt is growing. And in order to meet this debt, what is he doing? Well, he could be doing two things. He could be going to a money lender. A money lender is going to be charging higher rates of interest than the bank, okay? Or he could be going to a bank, right? The bank may not actually loan the money to him because if, because if they see that he has a debt, Right? And why does he want to borrow more money? A, to survive, or B, to try to overhaul his agriculture. He could say, well, maybe I'm going to switch crops. Okay? Or maybe I'm going to innovate in some way so that I can try to see if I can actually lower the inputs. Okay? Right? So he might want a debt to do that. The problem is if he goes to a state bank where the interest rates are much lower, the bank is going to say, you're a liability. So the likelihood of getting a loan from a bank is much lower, so therefore he goes to a private lender where the rates of interest are going to be substantially higher than they are if he borrows from a state bank, a state-owned bank. Okay? Now, this is the context here. And of course we have to ask, well, what is accounting for this differential between the inputs and what he's able to, the price at which he's able to sell? Lots of things might be accounting for it, okay? It could be the high cost of the seeds. It could be world pressures. So for example, one of the things that's happened is the lowered price of cotton in the world market, okay? Substantially lowered prices. It could also be subsidies given to cotton farmers in the North, in the United States. So this is where, by the way, these become global disputes. So the Indian government actually has a case pending before the WTO. The WTO is a World Trade Organization, as you know, right? Because the WTO is the organization that theoretically regulates these kinds of trades and subsidies and so forth and so on. And so the Indian government is saying actually that the subsidy given to these cotton farmers in North America, for example, has a vast impact on what happens to our farmers back in India, okay? Because these subsidies could mean that the American farmer doesn't have to worry about what rate he's producing at, because to some extent he's being subsidized. You know, okay, right? And it is having adverse consequences for the cotton farmer back in India, or a farmer producing soybean. Then you'd have to look at the price of soybean. Okay, right? So what we what we are saying is that look, you could do a pretty exhaustive, okay, you know, research on this, and some people have done it. I mean, they've also looked at these modified crops, as they're called, so, you know, genetically modified. Some of these people are now trying to grow genetic, genetically modified crops because that's, that's where the pressure is now, is you do that. But they're finding that the cost of growing this is enormous, okay? And it is not enabling them to be able to meet their expenses when they sell this on the open market, okay? But this is, as I said, a very, very brief capsule view of this question, but what it does is it raises all kinds of alarming questions, right? When we think about the future of India and we think about the state of the economy and how India is doing with respect to these questions. One, what is the investment? And here, when I say investment, investment here, I don't mean simply financial investment, okay? But what is the emotional, cultural investment that India has in its farmers and in Indian agriculture? And I think that's a key question, because that has been the backbone, not simply of the Indian economy, but some people would argue the backbone of Indian culture, right? That is that the rural landscape has been so inescapably a part of how we think about India. How is that landscape being altered now? Okay, that's question number one. And if you look at it, if you look at the financial aspect of it, then you would have to ask questions such as, well, you know, what percentage of the Indian budget is devoted to the question of agriculture? What is the Indian government doing here? What is the responsibility of the state? Okay. It also means, obviously, that in substantial parts of India, when you have this kind of agrarian unrest, the likelihood is 
that is going to lead to greater outward migration into urban areas. Somebody in that farmer's family is going to say, it's very clear that we cannot make a living through farming anymore. Okay, let's start the drift towards the urban area. And this raises a very important question. That is that, is the future going to be one where increasingly the rate of urbanization continues to grow? Or is the future going to be one where there's some sensitivity to what is happening in these rural areas and the Indian state makes a decision that what it has to do is it has to in some ways do something that facilitates economic growth in the rural areas itself, okay? So that you don't have that uneven development that you're having now, which will become even more uneven as a greater percentage of the population continues to drift towards the urban areas and more and more revenues of the state get expended in the, reven in the urban areas, okay? So I think that this is that second question. That is that what does it say about the nature of uneven growth or development, if you want to put it that way, in India, right? How does, it, how does this issue help us think through that? So I'm going to stop here. And uh, in my lecture on Thursday, I'm going to start to get into the question of politics and the Indian state. So please be sure you've done the readings for week four when you come to class on Thursday.